seen one of those you haven't done in a while. You always want to go back to the one that everybody knows. <laughs>
Romans chapter 11 this morning. Romans chapter 11. I say something about the wall builders meeting we had there Friday night. Thank you folks for praying for that. Those of you that came out to help, that was a real blessing. Uh, it was a great meeting. And I, I'll tell you, I, I couldn't sleep at all Friday. I was a uh, I was stoked. I really was. Uh, it was great the first Friday. The second Friday was even better. Amen. Uh, God blessed in a wonderful way. I really, I'm, I'm not, I'm not embellishing. <laughs> I'm just saying preacher talk. I'm telling you the truth. Uh, it was good, and God blessed. And uh, this, they responded to the teaching. It was good fellowship. And then, of course, Brother Egbert gave his testimony. And uh, really, I mean, Brother Egbert, he's given his testimony all over, uh, but. Uh, it was a blessing. I mean, God was all over it. And, uh, and I was so happy for him uh, that God used him in that way. And he's in a position where he can help a lot of folks. Amen. And uh, he was a huge help Friday night, not only to the ministry, but to everyone that came. Amen. And uh, the problem is that we need about a hundred more Egberts, and uh, we only have the one. <laughs> so I don't know what we're going to do next Friday, but be praying. Because I think that there's some things spiritually that are taking place behind the scenes. It's going to take some time with some folks. Uh, but uh, just a wonderful thing. Just a house full of folks that came for some help. And uh, it was a blessing to be a part of that. Keep praying, please. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. <clears throat> I love the Bible. Amen. I do. I, I believe it to be the Word of God. Amen. Uh, Homer Smith used to say, from kibber to kibber, including the kibber. <laughs> and uh, I believe that. I know that uh, people spend time with the Word of God, learn to love it more and more, as their understanding mounts more and more, and they mature more and more in the knowledge of God, then they begin to they begin to learn the Bible and have the ability to learn the Bible. And that may sound like you're frog leaping there, but this is the way God teaches. He teaches precept upon precept, and line upon line. And here a little and there a little. And so the more of the Word of God you know, the more you can learn. And, of course, you never stop learning. And I've often wondered if it's not going to work like that for all eternity. I mean, uh, I don't know that having a glorified mind would necessarily mean I'm going to know everything. Uh, that I'm going to have an omniscient mind. I don't know. I, uh, sometimes I believe, you know, knowing as I am known may just simply refer to the fact that I'm going to know myself as God knows me. And I could be wrong. I go back and forth on that thing. But having a glorified mind... <coughs> Uh, you know, it just may speak to the fashioning of it and how it works uh, without weakness there. It doesn't really speak to the fact that we're going to know it all. And if that's the case, then that would mean this. That one of these days, I'm going to have a perfect mind, incapable of, uh, of you know, uh, forgetting things and, and learning things wrong uh, without the weakness of ever forgetting those things. And uh, either way it works, it's pretty cool. Amen. <laughs> it's a good thing. And, and uh, I wouldn't mind being able to just, you know, learn forever. Learn forever of the inexhaustible, unsearchable riches of God Amen. and His truths there. And, uh, and I think that would be neat. Now, I like learning the Bible now. And the more I learn the Bible, the more interested I get in the Bible. And that's what we want to get folks, is get them where they're just starting to learn and they begin to realize, hey, the book is opening up to them. But it's hard in this day and time uh, because our culture has cultivated uh, an impatience with things, period, let alone the Word of God. And people by nature are impatient with the Scriptures. They're impatient with the Word of God. Kind of like a, a salesman, a Bible salesman I heard about, uh, he had sold ten times more Bibles than the professional salesman they had on the staff. And they couldn't believe he'd done this because after all he had a speech impediment. And they went to him to find out how he done what he had done. And they said, what is it that you asked him? And he said, I asked him, uh, uh, do, do you want to, to, to buy a Bible? Or do you want me to read it to you? <laughs> <laughs> and they, they're ready to buy it. <laughs> people, people are impatient. People are impatient, especially when it comes to the Word of God. Now, the Bible's a library. It's a book of books. It's 66 books. When you hold the Bible in your hand, you're holding a library in your hand. And every book in the Bible has a specific purpose. For example, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. It is foundational for the rest of the Bible. That's why those that would like to do away with the Bible, they're always attacking the book of Genesis. Because they'd like to do away with the thought of the reality of God. They like to do away with the thought of creation and where it came from and the creation of man. You see, because uh, the, the natural order of thought there is that if God made me, then I'm a 
accountable to God. If there's a creator, he's the judge. And so natural man would like to think that there is no God. And he reasons against that thought there, and he fights against it. And of course, Genesis will give us the first promises of the coming Redeemer. Now, each book of the Bible, like Genesis, has a specific purpose. At different times of my Christian life, if you would have asked me, what is your favorite book of the Bible? I would have given you different answers. <laughs> because really, it just depends on what I'm going through. Uh, whatever's happening in my life. That's the way the Bible is for us. I know this, that God has given us through the Scriptures, according to the testimony of them, 2 Peter chapter 1, He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And it's there in the promises of God that we have in the Scriptures. Now the book of Romans, uh, this is a special book, and, uh, and it should be special for everyone, and, and I suspect it is. It's the book in the Bible that pertains to the thought of justification before God. And what that means is, it's speaking to the fact of God justifying the sinner. Justifying. God in the role of judge. Bringing down His gavel and saying, You are just. You are just. Justification. That's the theme of Romans. Job asked the question, How can a man be just with God? He asked that question 1,500 years above that, uh, when Jesus was born, and then the Spirit of God moved upon Paul to sit down there and pin for us the answer to that important question. And folks, when it comes to you and I standing before God, that is a for sure thing. We will all stand before God. Amen. And the question, how can a man be just with God? That, that's the most important issue in your and my life. Amen. How is it that God could justify us? Verse 6 of Romans chapter 11. This is my text today. This one verse. It says, And if by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise work is no more work. The preacher J. Jallett said this. He said, quote, Grace is more than mercy. It's more than tender mercy. It's more than a multitude of tender mercies. Grace is more than love. It's more than innocent love. Grace is holy love and movement going out in eager quest toward the unholy and unlovely. The Bible defines grace in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, where it says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though He was rich, yet for our sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be rich. That's God's definition of grace. And of course there's one man that's very famous in his sayings as he made grace an acronym and he said this, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. And that's a good way to think about it. That's what grace is. Philippians chapter 2 speaks specifically about what we're talking about when we speak of Christ's expense as it details for us the sevenfold humbling of the Lord Jesus in going to the cross. He shows us first, Jesus made Himself of no reputation. He made Himself of no reputation. That is, what a lot of men live and die for, Jesus thought nothing of. Yeah, that's right. He made Himself of no reputation. <laughs> Secondly, He took upon Him the form of a servant. The Lord of glory. He did not descend to this earth to be waited upon. He did not descend to this earth to be ministered unto. But He came down to minister and He came to be a servant. And then third, He was made in the likeness of men. Think about this. People don't think about what it would have entailed for the Lord of glory to become man. But that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Him. He could not come down here in His perfect glory, in His perfect image there. He was made in the likeness of men. The Lord was. Think of the humility involved in that. Fourth, it says being found in fashion as a man. That is, not just in the likeness of men, as an angel would be, but it even says in Hebrews chapter 1, lower than the angels. He became a man, a human being, with a human body. And then fifth, as a man, he humbled himself. He was a humble man. Sixth, he suffered death. Jesus, the Lord of glory, suffered death. He said, no man taketh my life from me. He subjected himself to the limitations of humanity. He subjected himself to time. He subjected himself to death. And then seventh, it says, even the death of the cross. Now that, if we'll get a hold of that this morning, 
That'll, that'll shake us to our soul. Amen. There are those that have died glorious deaths and the death of a hero, the death of a martyr, but, but the death of the Lord Jesus was that of a sacrifice. When He died, He died on an instrument of torture and cruelty and shame and disgrace and He being made to be sin, who knew no sin, the Bible says He was made in that image so that God could judge sin and in that image, you know what He became? He became the object of God's wrath. He became the object of God's hatred. Why? So that you and I could be saved. That's why. That's called grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. And it says there, and if by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more work. Let's pray. Father, I pray that You'll bless this message this morning as I preach about Your grace. The thought, if by grace, help me, Lord. Help me to do the thought justice. God, we'll be reminded of Your grace in our life and Your grace in our salvation. Thank You, Father, for Your mercy. Thank You for Your grace. Bear witness to the truth of the gospel this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If by grace. Think of the ramifications of that. If it is by grace, and of course when Paul writes that, he knows it is. As I say it this morning, if by grace, I know that it is grace. But to draw some conclusions based on that thought. If by grace, that may help us to get a hold of some things that maybe some folks are struggling with today. You know, it's amazing to me how false sayings get started. Even more amazing how false doctrines get started. And many times, as major catastrophe as they turn out to be, they were very humble in their beginnings. A lot of times what takes place is you get these nice sounding cliches there that become doctrine to a lot of professing Christians there. What a cliche is, simply this, it's a, it's a way of stating an opinion that, that's so, you know, uh, wordy or, or catchy, witty, uh, that it sticks with you because of the way that it's worded. A cliche, it may be scripturally sound, it may not be scripturally sound. A cliche may represent a truth, a cliche can represent a lie. A, a cliche many times, as catchy as they turn out to be, oftentimes uh, they're biblically wrong. And just because it's witty and catchy doesn't mean that it's Bible doctrine. <laughs> we should get our Bible doctrine from the Bible. Amen. And there's some cliches, and you and I have heard them. We've heard preachers stand up and they've said, well, either Jesus is Lord of all, or He's not Lord at all. And have 20 people say, amen, and so it must be true. I mean, it's catchy. It's wordy. It's witty. I mean, that's going to stick with me. I can repeat that. But... Think about it, folks. Jesus is the Lord, whether we recognize Him as such or not. Amen. And one of these days, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is Satan included. And yet Satan we know to be a defiant spirit, a rebellious spirit, a deceiving spirit, and yet Jesus is the Lord. And one day He'll confess it. He's the Lord upon His throne over the world today. And yet the world today is under a curse. And Satan has a, has a principality and the power of the air there. He has a delegated authority due to sin. And yet Jesus is the Lord. So we want to make sure that we're being scriptural. We want to make sure we're being right there. The implication of the cliche, either Jesus is Lord of all or He's not Lord at all, is to reinforce a heresy, the fifth point of the heresy of hyper-Calvinism. And that is this, that if you're saved, you're going to live it. And to hear some people tell it, the thought is this, that, you know, if you're really saved, you're not going to live after the flesh. As if it's impossible to live after the flesh. No saved man or woman would ever live after the flesh. That's just contrary to the New Testament. Galatians chapter 5 says it is very possible for you to deny the Lord and to walk after the flesh. Amen. And to suffer the chastening hand of God. The corrective action of God. It is very possible. Amen. And just because you're saved, that don't mean you're always going to do right. Amen. 
And that don't, you can't just say, well, I, based on what happened in my life 25 years ago, I know I'm not going to do wrong. You better have more sense than that. Yes, and learn how daily to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Jesus right. Christ. Right. Because it is possible for you to live and walk after the flesh. Right. But either Jesus is Lord of all or He's not Lord at all. And what that fosters is doubt. Because folks, if we'll be honest and see this, this morning, we'll know that none of us are above committing the act of sin. Amen. And that being the case, someone says, well, and if you're really saved, you couldn't do that. Well, someone says, well, then I must not really be saved. Yeah. And they begin to doubt. Now folks, anybody that wouldn't doubt in that scenario, think about it, let's be honest, they're self-righteous. Yeah, right. If you had assurance of salvation based on how you live, that is the definition of self-righteousness. I do not know that I'm saved because of how I live. I know that I'm saved because Jesus lives. He's at the right hand of the Father. My hope is in Him and nothing else. And listen, I've trusted Him. It's all on Him. He's my Savior. Based on His death for my sins. Based on His resurrection for my justification. That's what I believe in. Amen. Now, because of that, I want to live for Him. I want to honor Him. Amen. I don't want to sin. The Bible says, I write these things unto you that you sin not. Then He says, if any man sin, <laughs> we have an advocate with the Father, Amen. Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. I'm glad that that's all in that one verse. <laughs> Amen. I write these things that you said not. I'm like, oh my. <laughs> but if you do sin, <laughs> thank God. He's made a provision. Amen? Amen. He's made a provision. Well, there's another cliche, and it goes like this. If you don't doubt your salvation, you have nothing to doubt. And that's catchy. That's witty. What's wrong with that saying? Well, for one, it advocates doubt. <laughs> doubt is not faith. The just shall live by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently look for him. Now, imagine preachers up here saying something like that. If you don't doubt, you have nothing to doubt. That says doubt is the evidence of salvation. That's how you know you're saved. How do you know you're saved? Because I doubt I'm saved. <laughs> You see, that's, that's just out there. It's not in here. <laughs> you say, where'd you get that? I got it out of the Bible. I know you did, because it's not in there. <laughs> you had to get it out of the Bible, because it's not in the Scripture. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We don't want to advocate doubt. Folks, listen, if you have, at one point in your life, realized you're a sinner, and believed only, on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. You have called on His name. Lord Jesus, save me. If your hope is in Him this morning, then doubting is not just a waste of your time and it's not just unedifying. It is a sin. Amen. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And it demonstrates in many cases they use these type of cliches that there's an improper understanding of the salvation of the Lord. I'm afraid a lot of times traditions have replaced the Bible. Clichés have supplanted the gospel of Christ in our area. And I'm afraid folks have relied upon the feelings of the flesh rather than the truth of the Word of God. Right. They're looking to the wit of men to stand good, you know, as a, as a genuine salvation experience there. And I, I've talked to professing Christians who not only, in speaking with them about how they got saved, did they have a real, what I would consider a shaky testimony of salvation, but they didn't even have a proper understanding of what the gospel was. They thought it was a type of singing. The gospel is the message of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, according to the scriptures. It is that message that God says is the power of God unto salvation. I'm afraid these altar experiences has simply replaced many people just simply believing the truth about Jesus Christ and dropping anchor there and knowing there's my assurance. Amen. I know I'm saved because the Word of God says I'm saved. Amen. And a lot of folks have went to the altar experiences and the feel-good experiences and that's replaced a, a faith and simplicity. Faith, trusting Christ alone for salvation. And you have preachers, they get up and they talk about what you've got to do to be saved and how you need to do this and do that. And listen, God 
has done, did the doing. There's a cliche for you. I don't know how witty it is. But everything that needs to be done to be saved has already been done. When Jesus went to the cross, He said, It is finished. And that's grace. The Bible speaking of Jesus there in eternity. In the beginning was the Word. I mean, when the clock started, He already was. He was with the Father in His glory. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And it goes on to say that the Word was made flesh. There is His taking part of humanity and subjecting Himself to time there. The Word was made flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, John says. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And he says, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's the truth. Grace for grace. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That pretty much sums up my experience with Him. He is gracious. He's a gracious Savior. In Acts 15, 11, when there was a dispute about the role the law of Moses played in regards to justification, Peter said this, quote, he says, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Paul the Apostle, who showed great courage and great compassion and a great burden by going back to Jerusalem, even though he had been thoroughly warned, he said this, he said, Behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Listen to what he said. But none of those things move me, neither count on my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. That's the message today. God's grace. Romans 3, 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And of course you're familiar with Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest He mention boast. For those that would deny man's uh, salvation just in simple faith, believe in the gospel there, they doubt the gift of God, which is eternal life. Listen, listen, if the Bible is true in these passages, I've just cited to you, and again, I have no doubt in my mind that what Paul hints at here in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, if by grace, that's absolutely true. He's not saying that it might be, it could be. He's making a point. And when he uses the words, if by grace, it is by grace. And he's trying to bring us to some conclusions. To understand the book of Romans, understand this. Again, it is a theme about justification. It's a thesis about it there, the inspired thesis about it. That's what it's dealing with, how to be justified before God. And I know there are those that would criticize the Romans road. And they talk about the Romans road there. They, they do this so they can criticize soul winning. They're not interested in soul winning. They preach against winning people to the Lord Jesus. Why? Why would someone do this? What Jesus actually calls fishing for men. Why would they criticize this? Well, they themselves are trying to absolve themselves from any and all responsibility of trying to win people to Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. All this I've heard folks preach against people walking down the aisle and coming to an altar and somebody taking a Bible and showing them how to be saved. I've heard people preach against that. Now, why? Why such foolishness? Because I, I wonder if they are able to take the Scriptures and lead someone to right. Jesus Christ. And so they talk about the, the power there, the glory coming down. Salvation is this mysterious thing where the glory comes down, you know, and there's this mourner's bench experience. And you pray through. Listen, salvation is not a product of your prayer life. It's not in the power of prayer that we're saved. It's by the grace of God that we're saved. And there is no divine power of God released through the mourner's bench. It is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, period. Amen. That's what the Scripture says. And, and I'll tell you something. There, there's, there's those that would, that would advocate elsewise because they do not want to see or do not want to partake in people coming to know Jesus Christ as far as being a part of that. 
either because they lack their ability to do so, or they just don't want to put forth the effort. But you and I are called to fish for men. That's to win souls to Christ. He that winneth souls is wise. Now, the book of Romans is easily outlined as we think about the thought of the righteousness of God. And, uh, and as we think about the righteousness of God and how that relates to justification, uh, understand that the righteousness of God is what is needed for God to grant His justification. In other words, you know what you do and what I do? We measure everything by ourselves. When we say, boy, that's high. That's because to us, it's high. That fellow's tall because he's taller than us. That fellow's fat because he's fatter than us. He's strong because he's stronger than us. He's old because he's older than us. He's just young because he's younger than us. What are we doing? We're judging things by ourselves. We're our own standard. You know, folks, we get that from God. God judges everything and everyone by himself. He is the standard. Being perfect as He is, He cannot render an imperfect judgment. And what is absolutely needed is you must be righteous as God. You have to have the righteousness of God. And the book of Romans begins to make this point there. In the first three chapters, the thought is righteousness demanded. Those chapters speak specifically to the fact of sin. And He says... That we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Why? It says that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. He goes on to say, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Righteousness is what is required. Righteousness is what's demanded. And the point in those first three chapters is, we don't have it. We've all sinned. There's none righteous, no, not one. We've all come short. We've come short of the glory of God. Some folks have come more short than others, but it doesn't matter. We've all come short. <clears throat> you can have a man, he's in a boat, and uh, he's fishing with another man. Unbeknownst to him, that man may have committed murder. Hole gets in a boat, both of them sink. Why? Because regardless of what's happened in either one of them's life, they're in the same boat. <laughs> and the Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man centered into the world... And death by sin, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Some folks come up short more than others. Doesn't matter. We've all come short. There is none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, and so he deals with that thought there about righteousness being demanded. And then in chapter 3, the end of chapter 3 through chapter 5, the thought is righteousness being declared. And what God simply shows us there at that portion of the book of Romans is that the righteousness of God we must have is in Jesus Christ. And he says in Romans chapter 5 verse 1, listen to me now. Here's what it says. I didn't write it. This is what it says. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's amazing how the Bible clear up a lot of confusion. Amen. Some folks would have you think, well, we're trying to be justified. We're trying to live good enough so that God will outweigh our good deeds with our bad deeds one day. But Paul says, being justified yes. by faith, we have peace with God Amen. through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It is a done deal. Amen. The righteousness of God that we must have is in the person of Jesus Christ. And when we receive Jesus as our Savior, God imputes to us His righteousness. Amen. Amen. And what a thought. He goes on to say this in Romans chapter 4. I'll read it to you. It says, To him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, if you're set on working your way to heaven, you're in debt. And the grace of God is not at work here. God's grace, it's either all by grace or it's not a grace at all. And someone, he says, that is trying to work their way to heaven, the reward is reckoned of, of debt, not of grace. But he says in verse 5 of Romans 4, To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. And listen to who he's interested in justifying. The ungodly. To him that worketh not. But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. What does it say? His faith is counted for righteousness. God said, I'll give him my righteousness. And he says, even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works, saying, 
Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Listen. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You know what the day I got saved? God, by His grace, put to my account, my record, His imputed righteousness. Input. He put His righteousness to my record. My sin was put to Christ's record on the cross. Amen. He died for my sins. He died in my place. He took my punishment. He gave me His righteousness so that God, through His faith, would justify me because of my faith in Him. Amen. And that's the way it worked. And God said, those that I have put my righteousness to, I will not impute sin. Right. Why? Because that would mar the record of Jesus Christ. And folks, if we could mar the record of Jesus Christ, not only if I could mar that record, not only am I not going to heaven, none of us are going to heaven. Amen. Because it's only by His righteousness we can go. Amen. We're justified on His righteousness and His righteousness alone. Now, the natural man reasons and he says this. He says, well, if that's the case, then God imputes righteousness by faith without works and then He refuses to impute sin. Well, if that's the case, why don't you just go out there and sin and live however you want to? Well, the Spirit of God moves on Paul to anticipate that very objection. And Romans chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8, that's exactly what he's dealing with. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And he begins to talk about in chapter 6 the flesh. And in chapter 7 he talks about the law. And in chapter 8 he talks about the Holy Spirit. And he talks about how to have victory in your life as a believer. And that subject there under those chapters is dealing with righteousness being defended. Righteousness defended. And then, as you get past that, he begins to talk in chapter 9 through chapter 11 about his role. And in that section there of the book of Romans, it's, the subject is righteousness declined. He says things like, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. He says, They have a zeal of God. I'll bear record to that, but not according to knowledge. He says, They be an ignorant of God's righteousness going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. He said, you know why they won't believe and be saved? Because of their own righteousness. It's blocking them from seeing the truth that is only in Jesus Christ. And they're holding to their own self-righteousness rather than believing the gospel of Jesus Christ and receiving God's righteousness. And the thought there is righteousness being declined. Now, chapter 12 through chapter 16 it's righteousness being demonstrated that he's talking about. He's talking about sanctification. He's talking about our service to Christ and how we're to live for God and the righteousness of Christ is to be seen in our everyday living. That's what he's dealing with there in those last chapters. But there in chapter 11, in chapter 11, speaking of the righteousness of God, he says this, If by grace, verse 6, If by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. God's going to justify us by His grace. And by saying the way that He does, by saying this the way He does, using the phrase, if by grace, again, that's to cause us to reach some conclusions. If it is by grace, then what? What does that mean? If salvation is by grace, and thank God it is. But if it is, what does that mean? Well, for one, if by grace there has to be a basis there has to be a basis for which God's grace can be shown. Because the most important attribute God has is His holiness. That's the most important attribute. Listen, the, the hyper-Calvinists would have us to believe that God just saves according to His sovereign decrees. And He just picks and chooses who He wants. Now that's a false plan of salvation. Uh, just wait, God picking and choosing. No, the way it went was... God sent Jesus Christ into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. It's not the sovereign decree and His divine election overcoming people and bringing them to repentance and causing them to be saved against their will. That's not the way it works. Jesus Christ came into the world and offered Himself up a sacrifice for all men. For the whole world He died. He came to the world to save sinners. That's all of us included Amen. and all of our kinfolk. Amen. He died for the ungodly. When we were yet without strength, Christ died for us. And, and God's main attribute is that He's holy. He's going to be holy. 
He wouldn't do anything wrong to save yours and my soul. He wouldn't do something wrong to save the souls of the whole world. God is light. In Him is no darkness at all. Amen. And we got today a, a, a lopsided view of God that gets preached many a time where people speak about His love and His forgiveness and His gentleness and His kindness. And I believe all those things and I'm thankful for all of them. Amen. But to the exclusion of His holiness. Right. And God is holy. Amen. God is holy. And when sin has been committed there under the law, it had to be paid for to the full extent of the law. And you think about that. People today, they, they question God and they say things like this. Well, you know what? I could never be so angry that I would send someone to hell. Surely God's better than me. I don't think He'd really do that. Now again, their rationale, their reasoning is going to be the basis of their what they believe. And you don't need to do that. Amen. You want to determine what you believe, you need to go to the book. Amen. According to this book, hell from beneath is moved for people to meet them at their, at their coming. It's a real place. Amen. People are there according to the book. And someone says, well, I wouldn't do that to somebody. Surely God wouldn't do that to anybody. Well, under the law, I don't think I would command someone to be put to death because they gathered sticks on the wrong day. I think I'd cut them some slack. But not the Lord. Amen. I don't think that if someone lit a fire the wrong way, like Nadab and Abihu did, sons of Aaron, I don't think that, the, that I'd send fire out of the Holy of Holies and consume them. But God did. Right. If the ark was falling and somebody reached up and tried to keep it from falling over, I don't think I'd strike them dead. But God did. Amen. Uh, talk about things like... Uh, a preacher eating in someone's house when he's supposed to go straight home. What happened? He died. Right. You see, I, you and I, we cut slack with people. You know why? Because we are one. <laughs> We're people. We're sinners. We look at somebody and they fail and we say, uh, ah, I understand. God judges by himself. He's the perfect standard. <laughs> And he's going to hold us accountable to meeting that standard. And he's eternal. And when someone sins against God, they sin against his holiness. And God is eternally holy. It's an eternal blot against them. There has to be an eternal payment. There has to be. God didn't just save people because he wants to. There has to be a basis. Sin has to be punished. It has to be paid for. And it was. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, died in our place, was punished for us. I, I've said it a hundred times. I'll say it a thousand more if the Lord tarries. The fact is that when it comes to, to Jesus Christ dying for us and, and His sacrifice and His suffering in our place, as we think about that there and, 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 and being in our right mind, understanding what that entails, uh, we're not, we can't add anything to that. Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If there's something else you and I could do to get to heaven, then it would have been right and proper for God to command us to do that. If there would have been a law that could have given life, then God could have given that law and said, keep that law. But there was no way. We were born in sin. It's our nature. It's not our second nature. It's our primary <laughs> nature. It's not second-hand nature to us. This is what we're born in. Natural sinners. And the basis of salvation is His death for our sins. The basis of salvation, again, it wasn't God looking the other way. It wasn't God winking at my sins. I didn't get off the hook when I got saved. My sins were thoroughly punished. Justice was meted out he was satisfied at the cross. If, if by grace, there has to be a basis to our salvation. Because God is holy. Second of all, the other conclusion that we have to reach, if it's by grace, it's not of works. It's not of works. Now think about it. If it was of works, what works are we talking about? Eternal life? How many works you got to do? How long you got to do them? 
If it's about works, again, what are we talking about exactly? Well, you've got to be baptized. Really, that's all it was? Just getting in the water? That's all it was? And yet Jesus went to the cross and died for us? God's riches at Christ's expense? And all I had to do was be baptized all alone? Right? Mm -hmm. It's not the water. It's not works. It's not the wafer. Amen. You don't want to eat a piece of bread and be Amen. saved. There's a basis to God's grace. God sent His Son to die for our sins. He paid the price. God raised Him from the dead to say, there, I'm satisfied with Him. And if it's by grace, it is not of works. That's, that's the point He's making in Romans 11, verse 6. And then third, if it's by grace, anyone can be saved. Amen. Not just an elect few. Anyone can be saved. Whosoever will. If you want to be saved this morning, you can be. Why? Because it's by grace. It is. It's by grace. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You know what he was? But he changed. God changed him. John Newton there, the old amazing grace, his epitaph there says, John Newton, clerk, once infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. That's why he wrote, a wretch like me. He was a wretch. I was a wretch. A worm. A worm. A sinner. That's me. By the grace of God. Paul said, I am what I am. Because I'm, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I wish to be, nor yet what I hope to be. But I'm not what I was. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. If by grace anyone can be saved, if by grace once a person is saved, they are always saved. Well, preacher, I just don't believe that. Well, you have a right to believe whatever you want to. But if it's by grace... You're wrong. <laughs> because it's by grace. I didn't write it. <laughs> it's not by self-righteousness, personal righteousness, personal integrity. It's not by personal obedience and willpower. It is by grace. <laughs> and if it's by grace, once you're saved, you're always saved. Someone says again, That's a, if I believe like that, I'd go out there and sin all I want to. One fellow said that to a black preacher in a black church. He said, if I live, if I live like you, I'd go out and sin all I want to. The preacher said, don't you sin all you want to now? <laughs> he said, no, did I want to. <laughs> if we told the truth, that'd be, that'd be the case for all of us. Amen. But people want to think, well, sin, that's in the bar, that's in the juke joints, that's, that's in the den of sin. No. To him that knoweth to do good, to him it is sin, and doeth not, to him it's sin. Right. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. Sin's a transgression of the law. Folks, it's easy to sin. Amen. It's easy to sin. If it was something there that your personal integrity you had to hang on to, if salvation was just the first installment plan, and now the rest of it's up to us, if he just erased the board and said you get a do-over, if that's all it was, we wouldn't make it yet. Because we aren't, we aren't fit for eternal life. Amen. You can live 80 years of a, being a good man or a good woman, 80 years. You think God's going to weigh that out one day and say, 80 years, I'm going to give you eternal life. No, he's just. <laughs> You've got to have his righteousness, and you can't get it unless he gives it to you. And he'll only give it to you by believing on his son, Jesus Christ. If it's by grace... Assurance of salvation, knowing that you're saved, it's not only possible, it's right. I don't have a doubt in my mind I'm saved today. Because I'm not going by how I feel. Some days I feel saved. I'm ready to charge hell with a squirt gun. There's some days I wake up and feel like somebody washed their feet in my mouth. I don't feel good at all. I don't feel spiritual at all. I'm in a bad mood. My back's hurt. My head's hurt. I got something I got to do. Don't want to do. I'm molly grumping around there. I'm 
confess and then make confess your parents. <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> There's some days I feel better than others. I'm not going to go by my feelings. Because they're like this right here. This book right here is the solid rock of which I have based everything I've trusted in to get me to heaven. Listen, I know I'm saved because of what the book testifies. Amen. He that hath the Son hath life. Amen. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on His name, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe in the name of the Son of God. Amen. Folks, God wants us to know. He wants us to have that thing settled. Either you have believed on Jesus Christ and His shed blood for your salvation, or you haven't. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If it's by grace, you can know you've been saved. If it's by grace, those that are saved, we will never be afforded a good excuse or reason, justifiable reason, to quit on God. Never. No matter what happens. <clears throat> Why? Because it is by grace. Hey. If our salvation is accomplished in our lives because of His grace, what, what has to happen to where God would say, you can quit, I don't blame you. <laughs> There's never going to be that excuse. There's never going to be that reason. If it's by grace, you and I, We've got enough reason to press on and persevere and endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ and fight the good fight of faith and be faithful and search and be passionate about seeking His face. Why? Because it is by grace that we're saved. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Hey, no one's going to get to heaven and start crowing about how good they live. No one's going to get to heaven and talk about all they've done. Right. We're going to sing, Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Because those of us that are going are going on His coattails, if you will. Right. We have the righteousness of God imputed to us because He was righteous. Amen. He didn't come short. He obeyed the law of God right down to the letter. He never sinned once, not in thought, word, or deed. Without sin, yet He was made to be sin for us. That we, it says, might be made the righteousness of God in Him. When we get to heaven, folks, it's going to be His work, His grace. We're going to sing about it forever. I want you to bow your head. Everyone praying.